was initially uh, targeted at making spatial inventories in developing countries. So that was actually by, done by aerial photographs, uh, and then all kind of techniques, how to do interpretations in aerial photographs. And if you look to time, you see actually that the technology changes, and that also is reflected in the name of the uh, institution. And in 2010, we joined the University of Twente and became a faculty. And that's actually when I joined uh, the ITC. And then we, this year we had a discussion, what, what shall we do? I mean, it's another 65 years, and then the Netherlands used to be the retirement age. So do we retire? Do we have a future? We were also faced with a lot of budget cuts a few years ago. So is there really a, let's say, should we continue? No, should we, and or should we retire? Now, fortunately, we decided that we should actually continue. And then we developed a new uh, vision and also new priority areas where we want to uh, develop ourselves. Now, this gives you an idea of the impact of ITC. I mean, if you exist for quite a long time, you have a lot of alumni. Now, this is the uh, combined uh, ITC Vente. But I can tell you that basically everyone in Africa and Asia, uh, and also Latin America, is, are the alumni of ITC. So 20,000 of these alumni are ITC alumni. And as you can see, they have a very good spread. But there's an emphasis on the English-speaking countries. Eh? East Africa, so West Africa is much less. And uh, we did a lot of projects and also students from Latin America. But it is also has almost ceased at the moment. So we only have a handful of students now from Latin America. The majority is from East Africa and Southeast Asia, uh, India and China. Now what has changed? Not only ITC has changed, the world is changing. I mean also the CGIR institutes are changing because there are new agendas, new actors, new thinking, new technologies, new possibilities. And that requires organizations, including ours, to change as well. And that's not always an easy discussion because people have been doing uh, things for quite a long while and they feel comfortable and then you need a lot of discussions to convince people that they should change. Now, what are, so what are, are we changing? Yes, we are going to change. This is our mission. So we still are focusing our uh, target group, still developing countries, the global south, and we want to develop geospatial solution, and that includes ge uh, remote sensing, to make a difference, to have impact. So we really aim for societal impact. So it's not technology oriented, it's impact oriented. And, and what we do is to bring in the newest relevant technologies, should be user uh, specified, should be have an impact. And if you, oh, there's a lot of text. What we're also going to change now, it's not doing your own little projects. We have a lot of students. We only teach MSc and PhD level students. Every MSc student has his own project, usually in the country of origin. The same applies for a PhD student. For your information, we don't have Dutch students. We only have international students. And what we want to do more now is to more aim towards more collaborative frameworks and collaboration in larger programs. So also the STARS program is one example of this kind of collaboration. So we're aiming for larger programs with societal impact and using our students and you using our information. And it's not only about food, I mean here, but it's also water, energy, health, land, housing provision. All these themes are addressed, and very often you have to combine them. So it's more moving towards more from multidisciplinary to interdisciplinary solutions and also way of working. And that's what we want to learn and train our students in. And that's also what we want to achieve. We want to aim our activities and, and change the way we train our students. So that's the individual level of capacity development. And the other one is more the institutional and societal uh, capacity development. And we want to work more together with other players. Because at the moment, what's happening too often Every country, every organization has its own emphasis. For example, ESA, the European Space Agency, has an agenda which is sometimes overlapping with the NASA agenda. And then in the same countries, you have all kind of well-meant capacity development projects, bringing the same type of technology in a different way, sometimes even having opposing technologies. And it's funded in such a way that you can't use information from one source with the technology learned from the other source. So there's a lot of duplication and a lot of, you could say, competition, which is not necessary. Another important development is the uh, development of the private sector. And that's another thing we want to develop more. We want to become more involved in setting up value change. And I think that's also for the survival, even for the CIMIT, very important that you have 
a good, uh, that's feasible and sustainable economic link. And that's something we also are bringing in into our way we do the projects and the way we do our teaching. So what we really look for is what we, you could call the value pyramid. What, what, if you look at the, to the left, you see the cost of collecting data. It's a lot of uh, already uh, money wasted on satellites, billions of uh, dollars and having the satellites in space. But then if you look at what actually the, the really added value and where you can make most money is when you actually start using the data. So you get from data transformed into information, information into knowledge, and then what they call the wisdom. And this is the classical ICT uh, pyramid. And where you can have the most added value is at the higher training levels, MSc and PhD levels. And that's where you can make a difference. That's one of the reasons we focus on, on that. And the other thing is that we want to involve and bring people together. So we already act as a knowledge hub, all the students, but also visiting staff from all over the world, spend some time at our institution and then leave. But we spend also a lot of time in our target countries because all the students have their field work in the target countries, supervisors go there. And also the training we do is jointly with other uh, universities and organizations. So the students don't stay all the time in the Netherlands. They and part of the training in their home host institute or home institute come to us and go back. So it's more about exchange of knowledge, people moving around on the globe. And what we do, well, this is something which is not relevant for you. If we look at our students, well, look around. I mean, look to your own kids if you... They change because they are used to a new environment. They all have a cell phone and mo most have a smartphone already, also in Africa. They're getting used to have instant access to information. So it's not having, it's not challenging them to get information, it's to be able to judge the quality of the information. They have become also more entrepreneurial. Students want to make a career, want it's basically, uh, they want to have a success. And they also are uh, used to communicate in an e-environment. And that's another development. Uh, what if you want to interact with the future farmer, this is the way. It's not by uh, meetings, it's all done by cell phone or by uh, all kinds of e-environments. Now, if you use this in the way you're setting up your teaching, so your the education is also changing, or you have to change it. It's more, much more life, long life learning, because technology changes fast. And when people graduate, I usually tell them, well, the moment you leave this room, you're already outdated, because it's, it's fast development. It's more, more on skill focused, because the information is already there but you have to develop the skill how to use it and also the skill how to learn yourself new technologies. It's therefore also more individual, so everyone can choose his own individual development during the training and the teaching, and it's therefore become more self-reliant, self-learning, and while well, e-learning is one of the tools, and it's what we call blended learning, so it's a combination of e-learning with pro program project type of approach where you actually um, force the students to develop their skills during the curriculum. So that's the way we are also now changing our education, making it more modern in a sense. It's a big challenge because our traditional partners in the developing countries are still doing the old-fashioned uh, information-oriented training in a very classical sense. So there is a huge gap there as well. And another way to address this, because there's more and more uh, demand for multidisciplinary skills, is that we are now setting up a new uh, MSc program to actually train students not only in the technology, that's what we still do, it's a lot of technology oriented, knowing the domains and also knowing applications. This is actually to combine these different application domain, domains to get a more broader MSc, so you get students who can actually operate in these large complex programs, but bringing spatial skills, because usually if you have these uh, geospatial environments like group decision room that's basically a kind of map or and then you have discussions about how to change or how to modify and to make that visible that's one of the way to get people together yeah? a, a map is also a way to bring people together because people start thinking differently about problems if they see it on a map now and the other uh, development of course the rapid changes in technology available I mean the, the cell phones is a very important one which allows us to have direct interactions with users. And crowdsourcing is a very often, uh, common use technology already with some limitations. And to bridge the gap between the satellites and the, 
and the real ground is the UHVs, is one development which is happening. And be aware that the UHVs even develop to micro level. I mean, these are already uh, operational robo flies. Uh, well, we'll give it a few decades, and we probably have huge fees like insects flying around collecting all kind of data. So this is still a further developing field. The other thing is more sensors. They have micro sensors in the field, in the soil, and you can immediately measure all the properties you want. So that it goes to a kind of a multi-sensor environment. But that requires a lot of geospatial data knowledge how to integrate. So this is the future. And the other future is and to make sure that people actually make it sustainable and the best way to make something sustainable is to allow people to earn money with it. So here you see two typical value change in the geospatial domain. The typical one is the, the old fashioned one, a survey company provides data, uh, generates the data which is converted to uh, information and then there is a kind of sophisticated users, could be a ministry or a big company like a soil fertility map used to make recommendations for uh, fertilizing. But more and more in the current situation, we have the right-hand side where we also start with collecting data, but then we have a more dynamic environment, more web-based. And then you can even think about things like phone apps, for example. But also the uh, car navigation systems fall into that category. So that usually are products uh, everyone can use. So you have a huge user domain, large group of people using it. Uh, and that requires a kind of different type of generating information because everyone has to be able to understand the data. Now, what, what typically happens in many of the target countries we have is that somehow these chains have gaps, and that has to do with local regulations, uh, with local also traditions, and very often has to do with the fact that a lot of the data is not open. People collect data and sit on data, want to sell the data. And as soon as that happens, business development is hampered. And, well, you have a discussion how you can uh, change it, but it's still happening, especially in Asia, Countries spend a lot of money even to have their own satellites or to, to buy the data, and then they want to sell the data. And there's who can buy this data, and usually one ministry sells it to another ministry. So it's all public money, and nobody actually gets access to the data. So the data has no impact at all. As soon as you open it up, and of course there, there can be some restrictions to it, then there will be all kinds of developments, and you have huge business development. And that's already happening in some countries, very good example. Okay, and this is what we want to achieve in 2020, very quickly. So we want to be more a kind of a network knowledge broker. So we like to collaborate with all kinds of other institutions, including CIMIT, where we bring in either our own knowledge or actually bring a contact to somebody else who has the knowledge. Because you, you only can do it together. And what we want to do is also to target our research and education more to these areas and also topics where we have the large projects. We want to have these projects in our current education. The education will be more modern, more blended learning. And also we want to make sure that the PhD and MSc topics are really targeted to relevant problems in the real world. So not only the technical uh, academic problems, but really have a direct link to a real demand or a real problem. And yeah, and finally we also, to achieve this, want to develop a little bit more on what we call uh, the last mile to really get to the end user, in your case that would be the farmer, but there are other types of users. Right? And we want to, uh, finally, we want to train our students to, uh, in entrepreneurial skills so they can actually set up and start their own business. So the University of Twente, of which we are part, has a very good reputation in business development. So there's a lot of knowledge base there, uh, and we want to use that knowledge to train our students how to set up their own business. Because at the moment, about five to six percent of our former students have their own business. One of them is even a millionaire based on his business. But it's an exception. We think in the, in the next decade, the larger proportion of our students will start their own business. But then, of course, you need the requirements like open data and stuff. And then this will happen very fast. Because, uh, and this, I think, the, the overall thank you, yes. So in a way, it's uh, more the ambitions. But I hope also to, uh, it gave you a flavor of what we are doing or, or trying to achieve and why we're here, actually. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Papa. Fast enough.
No, it's good to have diversity. I'm not suggesting that it should be uniform, but it should at least be, there should be a match. So at the moment, for example, people will develop a specific, uh, let's say, a software, open so a source software, which is not compatible to specific type of data or commercial software. And that's stupid. So what we try to achieve on the, on the longer term is I, we want to really go for only open data and open source software. So we already are offering our uh, in-house developed software uh, on a web portal that will be available soon. But still, that's, we are not going to suggest we're going to do everything. We only want to link up with already existing open source software. Because on the, we don't want to uh, make sure that the, the students should be, have access to open source software and not to very uh, expensive commercial software only. I mean, it's a choice. It's there. It's expensive. We have projects in terms of research projects. Uh, we don't have implementation projects. No. That's one, one of yes. That's one of the major uh, ways. We, we, so that's why we really combine capacity development is co the combination of research and education in our case. Because we yeah that answers the question. Okay. <laughs> Which is the one next? Which one do you have? Star E for this one? Possibly. Let's see what that is. Higher. What's the name of this one? Star C. No, that's not that. Okay, thank you for the invitation to uh, allow me to present uh, an overview of this project at this prestigious institute. Uh, you know, I feel honored to be allowed to say a few th words over here. So it's, uh, it was a very warm welcome to uh, arrive here in Mexico. Uh, and it's great to see the institute and the team and the work that you're doing. Uh, what I'm going to try do is squeeze my 30-minute presentation into less than that. Uh, so I may be skipping a few things left and right, trying to get to the key messages that I'd like to share with you today. Um, what, I, what I'm going to do is give an overview of the project, but also get into some technical stuff, because I was told we have a crowd of scientists here. And of course, you like overview stories, but uh, I know sometimes. Uh, I hope that's the case. The STARS project is a project that is really focusing on smallholder farmers and what current state-of-the-art remote sensing technology has to offer in that domain. We're looking at different types of stakeholders and we're trying to see and develop information products for those stakeholders that are based on uh, state-of-the-art remote sensing technology. That's sort of the overall red thread in the project. Within the project, we have different components that do very different things. And you will be hearing two more presentations today, one by Sibiri, who is representing, uh, who's leading the work in West Africa, and one by Urs, your colleague, who's leading the work in South Asia, specifically in Bangladesh. If that doesn't provide you with enough information, we have four, I would say, very colorful posters up on the wall here. Uh, after the presentations, do please pass by. But we're leaving them behind here in the Institute so they, they can stay for a bit longer on the wall. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, for another two years. 
Um, one of the starting points of this project was really about the observation that spatial information is revolutionizing agriculture in high-income countries, but this is not quite the case in low-income countries. And so we were thinking, why is that not the case? What is required to make that happen? What are the obstacles in making it happen? Let's try to understand that better. Um, but clearly, as you will know better than even I from the Netherlands, in low-income countries, agriculture comes with a lot of heterogeneity. That, these are very complicated systems with all sorts of dependencies and parameters that we do not always grasp. And since low-income country agriculture is generally information poor, it's very hard to make sense out of data that you have on that, the little data that you have on that. So STARS is really an attempt to learn together to identify opportunities for this technology, to identify the constraints and the risks, and to test a number of hypotheses. We, we do not make the claim that we're trying to complete in the possible hypotheses that you could set up. We, are, we have identified a number and we're testing those, but we do also well know that there can be many more hypotheses in this, in this overlapping area of smallholder agriculture and, and high-level technology. Specifically, so we're looking at very high resolution remote sensing technology in crop-based production systems and see to what extent we can derive information products that will help improve the livelihoods of small A Few facts, and I will uh, give you a quiz at the end of my presentation, see what you've remembered. Uh, we have six partners. ITC is leading this project. We also have the University of Maryland, not here today, they are running uh, the, the project component in East Africa. Then there's ICRISAT, who's, who's running it in West Africa. There is SIMIT, Bangladesh, as I indicated. We also work with CSIRO Australia and SIP, the Sweet Potato Center, uh, with those latter two partners really about, not about regional use cases, but about more central pub, uh, public uh, global goods. So we work in three regions, West and East Africa and South Asia. It's now a project that will run for 26 months, and that will be until June next year. Typically, this gives us one or two crop seasons in the various regions. Uh, there will also be an attempt to uh, generate a number of global public good contributions, and I'll talk to, about that in a minute. And it's, it's important to understand that this project is being served by two extra data contracts with commercial satellite data providers, one being Digital Globe and the other one, the other one being RapidEye Blackbridge, now Planet Labs RapidEye Blackbridge. So we get large amounts of data into the project, which allows us to work with very good resolution remote sensing data over the area, test areas that we're working in. In each, of the sub in each of the regions in which we operate, there are further collaborations ongoing with subcontracts and subgrants, typically with local firms or other entities, whether knowledge institutes, commercial parties, or, or uh, uh, public agencies. All of this is being funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So objectives. Try to be more rapid than I uh, already was. Better understand why remote sensing has not been put in use. Which investments are required to unlock the potential of remote sensing in smallholder agriculture. Work out a number of demand-driven use cases, very strongly focusing on what stakeholders think they need, working with them to develop those demands and make them understood. And then develop remote sensing-based workflows that can help improve the situation, improve the information that is there in the hope that that will lead to more rational, better decisions. There are side sort of by effects that we are also trying to make work, match private sector partners in this, thinking that we need to develop business cases so as to make things sustainable. And those private sector partners are, for instance, companies that could do satellite data or other spatial data analysis, companies that work with mobile platforms either obtaining information in situ 
or delivering uh, uh, information in situ, and then also public sector actors that allow us to per uh, pursue a number of uh, targets that we have set. So the, my, the main hypotheses in this project are the following, and uh, whether we, they hold, we need to see. Uh, we think that we can monitor crop growth in the areas that I mentioned, so Sub-Saharan Africa and Southern Asia, making use of time series remote sensing of very high resolution. And if we achieve in doing that, then this will give us much better outlooks for crop yield forecasting throughout the season, so as the season progresses. And that can inform policy makers, for instance, in those countries where food security is a, is a key concern. Uh, and we also believe that if we achieve that, we, we have the raw information that could serve uh, evidence-based uh, advisories to farmers, to farmer communities, possibly extension workers, or other stakeholders that are more interested in very local, almost field-specific information. Let me be very brief on this. Our main emphasis has been on what are the stakeholders and what are their information needs. Uh, next, we thought up, uh, or we, we went into exercises trying to develop the business case for those information demands, and then we started working out on the technology, making sure that that technology was put into place in such a way that we, this would really become um, a, a situation where this would work. I would need to say that the three regional use cases are very different in their uh, stakeholder definitions, very different orientations. Consequently, the business cases are also very different, but there is quite a bit of commonality in how we're developing the technology. And we're making a big attempt at making teams collaborate and, uh, you know, in, in collaboration tackle some of the technical challenges. Here at CIMIT, I should not be sharing this slide about heterogeneity in the agricultural landscape. Uh, in smallholder farming, this is especially a big problem. Small plots have a lot of variety in, in, in crops, in crop varieties. The farmers may know the crops, but not always the crop varieties. They may or may not know whether they are growing one variety. Uh, the crop systems clearly uh, vary a lot across uh, the regions. Soils and nutrient content as well, climatic conditions, and of course this big chapter on farm field practices. What do farmers actually do on the land? Uh, it should not be me telling you that because I do know that all of you are much more knowledgeable about this. I hope you, I hope you see the perspective that the, this is a very hetero genius uh, ecosystem in the world. So we are looking at a highly dimensional problem space and we need to sort of sieve out and uh, you know the, the value proposition of remote sensing is really you get a signal what you make of that. And in a way you would like to explain the signal by understanding the parameters in this multi-dimensional problem space. That's tricky if not impossible. So we're trying to work out a methodology that tries to untangle that. Uh, I'm not saying that we've come far yet. We've only just entered the stage of data analysis and method development. But I think in combination across the project, we are making progress and we will see certain interest. In this actually is one of the image, uh, one of the plots that we have acquired data for last year. This is a plot from Nigeria uh, and we're currently uh, at, at present making a study of textural parameters and how you can you know, use these in uh, the various challenges that we have. So please understand, in, in, in my story is really about smallholder farming in Africa, South Asia. That's a data poor context. We, from far away, know very little about what's happening on the ground and we'd like to know much better. Uh, this is important information clearly for a number of information demand situations. One particular one that I want to just highlight briefly here because uh, the University of Maryland is not present. 
2008, Tanzania saw a maize bumper crop. You will probably know this. The Tanzanian government was very badly informed about that arising situation, thought very differently about it, and made a very bad decision of buying in large quantities maize for, uh, uh, for national consumption purposes. In doing so, they totally wiped out the local market. Big problem. You understand the economics of that. STARS is trying to address some of that by getting better information and making sure that the Tanzanian government no longer makes, makes those mistakes. So that's some of, of the stuff that we're trying to do. I would say, I would say more generally, not only looking at uh, this peculiar case that we're addressing in East Africa, you know, I think that we should start thinking about how we can build what I would call an infoconomy where it's not about the money necessarily, about the information that you share, uh, that includes the farmer properly, you know, real inclusion, not only as an information uh, sink, but also as an information source. And we need to start designing that infoconomy where farmers are just fully included. That's a big challenge. We're nowhere close to that. But I think this is, what's, uh, is something that uh, needs to happen. Well, so I already said this, we're, we're operating in three regions. This is a part of West Africa with Mali and Nigeria. Uh, we have, Sibiri's team is working in Mali and in Nigeria both. Separate teams, they don't commute. There is a Nigerian team on the ground, there is a Mali team on the ground. The University of Maryland operates mostly in Tanzania, but they now have an extension area in Uganda and they're making good progress there and actually have impact on government decision-making. And CIMIT is working in Bangladesh and uh, both Sibiri and URS will, uh, in a few minutes, say a few, quite a few more things about those project components. So this is on the ground work, a lot of intensive field data collection, flying UAVs, working with the satellite data also required, very interesting, sexy cases to work, be working with. I'm really proud to be involved in this stuff, and lots of good work is happening in both these, in all these three cases. Besides that, location-specific work with very different focuses on stakeholder components, there is also an effort ongoing in the project that involves ITC and the Sweet Potato Center and CSIRO, plus all these partners in developing a number of global public goods, those are a study that tries to identify what are the opportunities for remote sensing in this domain and which investments are needed to make that happen. So that's going to be a booklet. There's also going to be uh, developing, uh, a, a methodology developed on what is UAV good practice, how do you do this stuff. And I know that your colleague Franz Salido is going to help us out in doing some of that because he's generated quite a bit of knowledge and your team actually probably more widely, I think. Um, we're building up a library of crop spectra and textures so that, and, and push that into the public domain so that can be uh, used uh, by uh, third parties. Likewise, we will develop an algorithms repository that allows people to work with the type of data that we have. And we're building up a knowledge portal that I look at as an entry point for aspiring junior students of the field of remote sensing and agriculture. Trying to speed up here now, but um, we should do well. So the STARS data collection takes place at different scales and at different intensities. Essentially, we have a data, oops, we have a data contract with Digital Globe that over all the sites delivers in the crop season, that is. Every two weeks, a world view two or three image. That's eight spectral bands or more, two meter resolution, plus a panchromatic image at, what is it, 40 something centimeter resolution. Rapid eye black bridge, also every two weeks, five spectral bands at five meter resolution. So we get different scales there a little bit. Uh, clearly these acquisitions come with challenges. Cloud cover is a big issue. Um, off nadir angles are also a big issue, over 20 degrees or so. Your 
images are really not very useful because you can't properly uh, geometrically register them. The pre-processing is a bit of a thing, and then the analytical processing with which you've only just recently started, and there are some licensing issues, of course. Originally in this project, we had the ambition of bringing substantial components of this data set into the public domain so that others could use that in, in exercise materials, etc. But I have to admit that we have left that ambition behind because we couldn't make it work at a reasonable cost. There were promises. Okay. We also do field data collection a lot. Uh, Image-wise, this is taking place with UAVs. We are flying EBs in many places, and both Sibiri and, and Urs are probably going to say something about the specific machines and cameras that they operate. Uh, we also have octocopters that we fly in a number of places. There are challenges there, I would say at this stage, hardware robustness, possibly also software reliability, you know, the, the software with which you fly the machines. Image stitching and spectral calibration are some of the challenges that we're facing. So what this brings us, if you combine all these data collections, is quite an interesting and uh, unprecedented almost image data stack. Uh, some teams are use it, making use of MODIS data and Landsat data, and then the Repetai Blackbridge data that we've just seen, the Worldview data from Digital Globe, and then also the UAV data. And this gives you all sorts of different spectral combinations, revisits, etc., that are different. But um, for instance, you can typically have UAV image data at two centimeter resolution, and of course with MODIS you go up to the 250 or 500 meter uh, spatial resolution. Uh, this illustration is on the wall, also there. If you want to know the specifics, don't write them down now, but take your cell phone and make a copy, or email me uh, and I'll send you a PDF, of either that one or that one. So, I've said something specific as an overview of the project, I'd like to spend a few slides on the technical challenges that we're currently facing. Many of these things have we've started to work off on. We have some initial ideas about, but they're largely also still open questions. Technical challenges. Um, the first technical challenge I, I would like to coin reading the tangle called reflectance. We have reflectance, you know, we have properly we have properly pre-processed images. We can look at these things, but what is it actually that we're seeing? You know, what, what can we do with this stuff? So a big question here is how can we actually automate field delineation? That is, you know, in, in northern Mexico, that may be easy. And in the Corn Belt in the US, that may be easy. And in some other northern agricultural context, this is easy, but not so in Africa. In Africa, smallholder fields are very often ill-defined. Uh, one field sort of graduates into the next, and you see mixes of crop, etc. So getting that done is a big challenge. Suppose you have it done, then how do you recognize crops? How do you recognize mixes of crops? How do you potentially recognize cropping systems? Open questions. Possibly we will have partial answers. I do think we will make progress in this, but it's still quite open. Can we possibly determine planting date out of the images? We will have time series. Yeah? Can we sort of determine planting date from that? Can we determine crop phenophase? It, it, is it visible what this is? And if you know it's maize, suppose, I, I'm not sure, could be. If it is maize, can you actually detect at which phenophase we are here? Can we even determine crop condition? Open question. I'm not going to give you answers today, but please invite me over in another year and I'd be happy to share some of the results. Um, specifically that we're currently working on in this team is the derivation of Im image texture. Uh, I think some of the, the same field, different textural analyses, Clearly, you need to pose yourself the question, if you want to derive image texture, what's the purpose, actually? Because image texture to determine the crop 
may be needing different techniques and image texture that determines the farm management. Um, so that, that's certainly a key question. The approach that we're currently taking is pose the big question, which is actually the image signal that you're using. Are you looking at panchromatic data? Are you looking at single band, uh, single spectrum data? Or are you looking at some choice of vegetation index? Uh, and different purposes may require different choices. Uh, my team is very strongly of the opinion that you should not immediately say NDVI here, because you know there can be better vegetation indices for certain purposes. We're also looking generally at FMU statistics, where FMU stands for the field management unit. And we think of this area here as a field management unit. And we're also looking at a rather specific statistics known as GLCM-based statistics, uh, which says something about, you know, how do pixels and neighboring pixels, uh, how often do they pair, et cetera? Can you read structure into that? The open questions then again that go back to the purpose question is, what are the, the optimal quantization levels? What are the angles that you were, would, would want to look at? What are the lags, the distances between pixels that are really interesting and that give you stuff? Uh, very early results are not very positive yet, but we need to go further. Here is some stuff that essentially makes an attempt to look at dependency of lag in terms, in terms of pixel distances. But, um, and where you see that uh, at quantization level four, so you, you're, you quantize your image only at four levels, it, this is sort of a constant over the lag distance. So apparently that there is very little information in the lag. But if you then compare it to the same stuff taking to 16 quantization levels, you see essentially the same constants, which in a way is something to be expected. But you do see that there are some differences here in the outcomes. Very early, we don't want to say much, but this hopefully is going to inform us about what are appropriate quantization levels. I want to take the last five minutes, can I? Three, two, two, okay, I'll try. Some, some, some early result that we've achieved and that has made me happy at least, because I think it, it, it empowers us to do certain interesting work. This is uh, really uh, the problem space of image co-registration. You get two images. How do you make sure they match properly? Preferably at the pixel level. Not trivial at all. Really hard to do well. This is work done by Valentin Tolpakin mostly. Uh, the illustration comes out badly because of all the extra light. The ambition that we have there is trying to work towards pixel time series so that you can follow one pixel in time not a whole area, one pixel, and that you can do temporal development of whatever at the pixel level. Because we, we, we are hypothesizing that if you can do that, you, and you can do that over all pixels within a single farm plot, you can get much stronger statistics than when you would do that for the farm plot at, at an aggregate level. So the state of the art is uh, if you want to do that uh, with key point detection, then that fails typically on farmland often because there are too few key points that you can uh, uh, identify. The innovation that we've had and that seems to work for West Africa properly, and I'm here saying, and I expect it to work for East Africa also, is to base this on trees in the landscape, which are these red little uh, blobs there. And what Valentin has been able to do is work out a model of trees so that you could recognize those in your images and you use those as the anchor points with which you do the co-registration. Uh, this requires actually that you understand a little bit about remote sensing in depth, that you understand what is solar angle and viewing angle, that the tree that is here gives, gives um, a shadow and that you understand that the shadow also tells you something about the tree crown shape. And so we're working with models of trees and, and we have a model that identifies this tangential point so that you can quantify the shadow. The, this is based on the so-called Pollock tree shape model. 
And in the end, what uh, we've achieved is that as trees stand up from the, from, from, from the field, you, know, the, you have a different angle there. And so what you need to do to make this totally co-register is really understand what is the sun angle, where, where does the shadow go, understand also what is your viewing angle, and from a model that includes the tree shape, you can then understand that this is the actual position of the tree. So what you see in the image is not where the tree is, it has a little, it has a little uh, transposition in the image. And with this model in place, we are capable of using the trees as anchor points in our image and do the proper co-registration. And we've so somehow shown that the error caused here is at the sub-pixel level. And you can't get it better than that. Okay. I throw you my business card. Uh, if you want a real card, it's in my pocket. Come and get it after the presentations. That's what I have to share with you. Yes, but when we started the project, we did not know this ourselves. Let me say that first. But we were, we were projecting that we would, what, when working with farmers, we would find out what are the propositions that make most sense to them. Um, there is a lot of variability, and, but that variability is hardly ever really quantified. And so even if perhaps you cannot turn this into farm plot specific advice, you can at least start quantifying this and, and study some of the variability that is there in the landscape. But the team that has, most, has worked mostly on understanding what you can do with this type of information is the West African team led by Sibiri. And so uh, without wanting not to do justice to your question to me, you know, if you want the real answer, you should certainly ask Sibiri who uh, who has been developing this over the last year and a half or so. And uh, they've come up with at least one clear answer, but I think they also will, will say that, well, there is still open space there in the expo range. Very nice. Thank you. That's called a bridge. In, that's called a bridge in Dutch, right? <laughs> Um, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to present a few results and background on the West African component of the STARS project. We call it Isabella, which is a, a convenient name to remember for imagery for smallholders activating business enterprises and leveraging agriculture. <coughs> if this is this, uh, I have to know whether I know how to work with this. Not yet, one second. I think it's because one is still asking for. No, I don't have it. I'll, I'll speak from here. Huh? OK. 
okay, it, it overrides the, the keyboard, I think. Mm -hmm. That's strange. I have another one. I'll put the, I can, let's see. All right, I think I'll do it with the keyboard. Okay, here we go. I'll do it with a keyboard. I give you all the all the stuff. You want this too? <laughs> here we go. All right. So, yeah. So in West Africa, what's um, I think uh, quite particular, but everywhere I think in the developing world, is that we work with very heterogeneous uh, smallholder systems. Uh, in the two countries where we work in, you can see that the first the field size is small, on average 1.45 hectares in that part of Mali where we're working, and 0.22 hectares in that part of Nigeria we're working in. Of these, in Mali you have mostly pure crops, which are um, cultivated in a rotation. But in Nigeria you have very dominantly mixed cropping. In fact, 95% of the fields have at least two crops concurrent, and more than 50% of the fields have at least three crops concurrent. On top of that, uh, farmers do relay cropping. So you might end up with one single field having anywhere between two and six crops per year in a single growing season, which is a big problem when you think of it from a very top-down remote sensing perspective of recognizing crops. So you can see it on the upper right side this uh, photo shows you a field where you have sorghum, you have pepper, you have onion, and you have tomato all together in a single field. And that's fairly st the standard, um, standard practice in that cropping system. This is because this is a system where space is completely saturated. On the right-hand side, for about a three-kilometer wide uh, excerpt of the imagery, this is the parcel database that we extract from the imagery. And we work specifically at documenting the yellow part. And we monitor with the blue uh, outlines um, about 100 fields with UAVs for different uh, kind of uh, variables. This is what it looks like on the Mali side, which is much more, much larger, uh, much fewer fields, but still a very uh, high, very high density of uh, cropland uh, use intensity. And you can see on the left-hand side on the upper um, upper quadrant, the kinds of uh, heterogeneity issues that you'll find in smallholder systems where maybe there was a stubble of some former tree or something and you see the plow was not able to uh, carry the furrow through. So you have all kinds of uh, micro uh, heterogeneity effects like this to think of. Now what's happening today is that uh, remote sensing is changing Obviously, it's more granular, and those images are, are, are images we acquired last year in 2014 from uh, uh, digital globe data with Worldview, where you can see quite clearly uh, the effect of fertility treatments. Those are things we adapted from what Ivan is doing uh, here in Mexico and elsewhere. And as you increase the, fer um, the amount of fertilizer, you will see the response of the crop uh, here around the time of, uh, of flowering. But what you also see, for example, on this sorghum field is that there are many, many other areas of the field where you have the same response. And in fact, uh, that level of fertility was not applied. So we had two value propositions in the West Africa case. Uh, the first one is really about addressing the issue of land security. So it's really uh, more about uh, developing, um, well, showing how we can use imagery at a very high resolution to accelerate the generation of rural cadastres and empower uh, local communities um, in the management of their land capital. Uh, the second one is really about generating the baseline data that we need to recognize crops. Originally, that's what we were intending to do. And you will see that uh, in the end, uh, we have uh, um, stumbled on a few roadblocks. 
if you look at it more from a schematic perspective, uh, the first value proposition is the one below the brown dash line. It's, uh, uh, I would say, um, a very participatory community engagement process where we develop with them land use conventions initially as precursors of uh, what we envision as land tenure information services. We also involve the private sector in the development of those tools uh, because in the end, they are the ones who are going to carry uh, the provision of that service to the communities. On the upper side, above the, the blue dash line, we have all the agronomic work where we monitor uh, crop performance from UAVs, from remote sensing, and with fertility treatments a, a bit as a, well, our Trojan horse, not only to uh, look at crop response, but also to engage farmers. And some of the information we generate might uh, be deemed of, of use by farmers or the intermediaries like agro-dealers. Some of it might uh, crush and burn. This we do in two sites. Um, this is coming from the uh, soon-to-be-defunct uh, dryland system CRP, uh, if not already. Uh, you have two transects, one with this kind of whitish outline uh, towards the, the left of the slide, which runs from northern Ghana to southern, southern Mali, and samples a range of cropping systems, uh, very variable socioeconomic conditions, but more or less um, invariant biophysical conditions. And the other one is uh, with the black outline crossing from Nigeria into Niger, which samples exactly the opposite, so the biophysical gradient socioeconomic conditions being fairly uh, constant. So what STARS allowed us to do, it, it was really, it's almost an accidental project, I would say, as, as we see it. We had the chance of maybe luring the Gates Foundation in investing significant resource to get unprecedented uh, satellite data in particular, and also to fund uh, UAV acquisition, which is quite expensive. I would say the, the return on investment is not yet really proven yet. <laughs> but we accompany this with a lot of ground data. So these are individual fields in the case of the Mali site where we monitor crops on a biweekly frequency uh, for a number of variables that, that you see there. Uh, inside of each field, we have those fertility treatments, uh, 225 square meters each. Inside the fertility treatments, you have different quadrats. And inside each quadrat, you have different plants that we sample for a number of um, development and growth uh, indicators. So these are the kind of, uh, of results that you, you generate at the individual field where you see that um, there is an enormous amount of variability in the response of the crop biomass for maize, but also uh, the yield uh, from one field to the next and for all those fertility treatments. Uh, we also learn about the reasons behind those, this variability in, in, in management by um, providing farmers with what we call certificates at this point. But in the end, our objective is to develop with our private partner an app where we can uh, show them every two weeks with uh, some time lag the current condition of their crop relative to either um, multi-season normal or uh, relative to the surrounding cluster of fields cultivated in the same crop. So they can uh, interpret and help us elicit whether there is any kind of value in that imagery. So I just want to show you something um, to uh, visualize how a field boundary changes over a single season. And you will see with me that it's an extremely complex picture. Uh, if you look at, if you, if you keep in mind the fact that many of the remote sensing work is only based on one image in the season, or perhaps two images, then the conclusions that you're going to draw from one single image are going to be uh, a very constrained in time. Uh, and what really STARS allows us to do is to look both at the very high resolution, but also the high um, um, repetitivity, ideally every two weeks in our case. So this is what it looks 
uh, what it looks like when you when you look at the NDVI values, you will see that this is uh, the effect of the fertilization on one crop. I think in this case it was uh, um, yeah, the, the peanut, I think I was showing here. But then if you add um, that same response across all the fields of that crop and more so all the fields of the five crops, this is the kind of variability that you're looking at, and you will see very quickly that the effect of fertility treatment is drawn by the crop type, which itself is drawn by other um, interactions between management and environment. So the conclusion of this is, as we are asking, asking the right question when we say, as remote sensing people, we want to recognize crops automatically from remote sensing. Obviously, here it seems quite difficult if you look at it from another perspective, uh, on the upper left quadrant, this is the response of a field of cotton to the different treatments of fertility. On the lower left, this is the response of the different crops to the same uh, treatment level in fertility. And on the low, lower right, this is the response of cotton fields for one single treatment, but across all fields. And you will see that management and environmental effects uh, completely override the difference between the crops and the difference between the fertility treatments. So if you don't know something a priori about what crop you have on the ground or what type of management practice like the sowing date, then you're, in a, uh, you're facing a tough time to say that, oh, uh, we are going to be able to automatically recognize which crop we have on the field from remote sensing. So what you can do is to look instead at the potential of the technology for monitoring uh, crop growth. Uh, the bottom um, graphics, for example, will show you the response of, um, well, the, the um, canopy height uh, estimated from UAV data uh, relative to that measured on the ground. So it's a fairly robust relationship. And what you can also see is that if you stratify your um, landscape according to catena and soil types, then you will get a, a bit of a better capacity to discriminate between crops because there's a lot of that variation which is encompassed in the soil types, but also in a proxy of the soil type in that case, which is the tree density, which also explains that uh, big uh, intrafield variability you see in those uh, time profiles for the season. So uh, what this is really teaching us from STARS is that we are completely moving from a, a data sparse to a data rich uh, paradigm in research. This is a, a project concept that we have developed for the Sustainable Intensification Innovations Lab where we show that, well, we propose that a heterogeneity with the kind of data we have today can be exploited. Uh, we can take advantage of it instead of trying to uh, reduce it. And one way to take advantage of it is to completely embed uh, the uh, use of mobile services in the development of the products. So we can build on existing platforms like these uh, market information services that some private partners already provide in the regions and start um, in embedding in them uh, the use of image products. Uh, to help, for example, optimize uh, resource use. One of the problems that, uh, that we have um, learned about is that, for example, in the case of um, land tenure, in rural areas, there are very few land transactions that actually occur. You have land fragmentation because as family grow, fathers um, um, fragment the land between their sons, for example. But this is not considered a land transaction. The father doesn't sell the land to the son, or um, it's not registered as a land transaction. So there's very little leverage that a private sector uh, partner can have to um, build a, a business model on. So one way we, we, we are thinking of is combining uh, what we design as this container, so the information about the, 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 the field boundaries and to who they belong, et cetera, with the agronomic advisories, the, the content, uh, to help them develop a, a business model. 
So this is something we do with a company called Manobi in Senegal. They also already have a lot of uh, uh, mobile platforms that are running and that we use, for example, in this case, to collect land, use land cover. So we embedded the JCAM protocols inside their own uh, mobile platforms. And we develop with them a number of apps like this, uh, this STARS one, which uh, we use, for example, to uh, help them relate uh, the performance of a given field to the neighboring cluster. So again, um, there are a variety of outputs that can be imagined from um, the current uh, incarnation of remote sensing products targeting a number of outcomes and a, a big uh, part of our work, which takes quite a bit of uh, a time, it's not typically what scientists do, is to try and evolve uh, business models that are sustainable uh, across those, um, those different types of uses. So uh, I'm getting to the end. The, the learnings we have from this, uh, what we call this last mile, uh, first of all is that one of the big problems we have in terms of land tenure is that, and monitoring land tenure from remote sensing is that field boundaries are very dynamic. Um, I estimate that in, in Mali, about one third of them change from one year to the next. So it means that if you want to develop a model for that, uh, you have to know that every uh, year, you, ha you will have to rerun a fairly um, a CPU intensive algorithm to be able to extract and update your parcel database. Uh, I already mentioned the second point. One thing that we learned is that in many communities, actually, there are taxation schemes that are already in, in force uh, where um, communes or the mayor's office levy taxes on farmers for the number of donkeys they possess, the number of carts, the number of cows, the number of bikes, the number of firearms, etc. So there is actually a potential because the institutional setup is already conducive to tax um, levies. So we could imagine that people could accept a kind of land taxation in the future. But uh, as far as the business model of it is concerned, we know that we cannot yet uh, sustain a business model only based on land transaction unless we target uh, peri-urban areas, and that's a kind of a different system where there the volume of land transaction crosses a critical threshold. Uh, from the crop monitoring side, not possible to recognize crops yet uh, due to higher variability in the management and environment. I mentioned this. Uh, there is potential for improvement through uh, catena uh, strata, through texture analysis, through the monitoring of canopy height, which can be a fairly strong discriminant of crop type in, in our systems. Uh, but we think that in the end, uh, when uh, within 10 years from now, many farmers are going to be able to be connected into some kind of mobile service, it might be much cheaper just to just crowdsource that information from them. Uh, on the other hand, there are significant opportunities for performance monitoring uh, and um, resource use optimization. So. Well, the next step that we are thinking of right now as we head towards the end of, uh, of STARS is uh, throughout three, three levels of the research pipeline from discovery to proof of concept is to um, see whether what we have developed is replicable over space, see whether we can tie the remote sensing data with uh, predictive models. Uh, and this is something that we are uh, connecting to our AGMIP work and also see whether we can use uh, operational remote sensing sources because all what I shown was based on commercial imagery which costs typically $1,500 for a 100 kilometers, a square kilometer area. If you have to purchase it as a service provider every month or every two weeks, um, it's very different from um, Sen Sentinel-2 which is going to provide you freely uh, every uh, five days, uh, 10 meter, um, pixel size data to monitor uh, field performance. And that's really going to be a big uh, game changer, we think. So we've already started prototyping how to use that with the Spot 5 Take 5, which is a kind of emulator of what Sentinel-2 is going to look like. Yeah, this is, um, yeah, this is another way of 
thinking of it, this is actually a proposal we put into the G4AW, which wasn't successful. But we were called later back by the um, Dutch embassy in Dakar to try and develop a system where we um, bring the power of these types of imageries, both agrometrological satellites toward the, um, the left-hand side, and then the very high-resolution imagery together to provide um, advisory products to a range of stakeholders from the smallholder all the way to the financial services, especially the index-based insurance. So I want to acknowledge now a number of partners. AMET is an NGO. They actually do all the UAV data processing. We don't process any of it at ICRISAT. So um, the, we, we have developed the protocols with uh, Wageningen University and uh, Université Catholique de Louvain. And they are implementing it. Um, GERSDA is a group specialized in land tenure issues, people, uh, law people in the university, UCL in Louvain, Belgique. Uh, Wageningen, ITC, the Nigeria uh, Space Agency, the Center for Dryland Agriculture at Bayer University in Kano, IER is the NARS in, in Mali, ICRISAT, Manobi is the private partner we're working with based in Senegal, UDS is uh, Université de Sherbrooke in Canada, and the Gates Foundation and local partners. So thank you. This is um, one of our GCPs, which is actually being used by uh, women farmer who dry moringa leaves <laughs> because it's a convenient uh, flat and dry place for them to, to use. Yeah. Try to make my best, you don't starve. So this is the work we have been doing in uh, Bangladesh. Uh, this is built on uh, the CISA MI, CISA Mechanization and Irrigation Project. And this is what the landscape in Bangladesh looks like in the winter months. You see a few patches of green where they irrigate, grow usually rice. Um, but a lot of land is like left fallow or grown with uh, mung bean or La Fires, although I must say like it's about two thirds are actually grown with this low input, low output legume crops yield like of uh, mung bean is about 800 kilograms per hectare. So it's really not much. And also the whole region actually this is a low input system. They use hardly any fertilizer for the rice production during the monsoon season. And then the legume production in the winter also occurs with practically uh, without any fertilizer. So there is basically, but there is big potential to intensify production by uh, either growing a cash crop like a wheat or maize, or also to actually increase mung bean production, which I'll show you how that can be done. So this is, yeah, we have dry period from January to March, and then in April the weather turns and you get storms and uh, also quite heavy rains. So it also shows you like the infiltration rate is quite slow, so you get sort of flooding very quickly. As I said, uh, we did two, actually the, our project has two objectives, to do an analysis at the macro level, basically to see uh, what happens if you start would to irrigate all the land. There are about, our area is about, the study area covers about 100 by 70 kilometers. It's about more than 400,000 hectares. So the idea, you could imagine a scenario where you irrigate every piece of land. So that will obviously then affect the uh, water flow in the rivers and also salinity levels. So we collaborated with the Institute of Water Modeling, which is doing an in-depth uh, ex ante analysis and then our the semi part is basically the work on a development of an irrigation scheduling app for maize, wheat, and mung bean. This 
built on a work we did before part of, as part of the CESA project. We lo uh, looked at land use intensity in three years. Uh, this is quite stable over the years. Uh, the white spots you see in the lower left corner, this is basically all used for shrimp production. So cell line conditions and anyway, shrimp production is much more uh, profitable than production. Then the dark green areas are either uh, rice, uh, borrow rice using subsur uh, surface, subsurface water. There's also a lot of maize production in the Cheshire area. And south of Furipur, there's a lot of wheat production. But if you look Borishal and south, this is all low intensity. That's uh, the area we're targeting on. This is a part of the work that the uh, Institute of Water Modeling does. Basically, everything uh, that's shown in brown is within polders. So it's really the whole landscape is flat, like Borishal at the north is about three meters above sea level. And it's about 100 kilometers from the coast. So it's more or less just flat. And this is sort of what, um, how they manage water. Basically, the challenge is to prevent flooding. And also, there were some other previous irrigation projects near Borishal, but there is maintenance of the system that's very poor. And then IWM did sort of a study, like looked at all the surface water bodies, like canals and so on, that actually could be used to bring the water to the land. So they're doing sort of an, uh, an analysis of what actually will need to be done to irrigate the whole area. I mean, there's, as you can see, it's a really high a dense network actually available, so there would be big, wouldn't be that difficult to actually uh, bring uh, water to all the land. It's just some more work that they intense. So, yeah, we did basically uh, our, some targeting to find out like where there is low land use intensity, and that's the area we are uh, uh, concentrating on. As you can see, uh, this wheat harvest on on the left you see maize. You can grow up to eight tons of maize quite easily. It's very fertile. This mung bean also, our work showed that you can easily double with uh, mung bean production to about 1.6 tons per hectare. And mung bean is high value crop, so uh, has really big potential. So you don't really need to switch to the high input crops like wheat and maize because mung bean, it's just you need more irrigation, one or two more to double yield and grow it on beds. So this is also yeah, harvest of mung bean, one of the few times when you see women on the field, actually, usually all work is done by male labor. And at the heart of our irrigation scheduling app is uh, the, a model we're working together with uh, Joe Ritchie, the developer of the Series May Series V models. And our challenge is we, we're dealing with a water table that's clo very close to the surface. We monitored it over the season. And it changes between one to about three and, a half me three and a half meter depth. And we calculated that the capillary upflow is about two millimeters a day. So this is about almost half of the evapotranspiration. So, and so far, none of these crop models actually can deal with the water table. So we are changing now the water balance of the model to um, account, to be able to account for capillary upflow. It's also very different from most other irrigation schemes because usually uh, one tries to separate the water table from, this, uh, from, the sur uh, from the upper parts of the soil profile because you don't want to have any upflow of salt. So therefore, this is sort of a, in Australia, they have similar conditions, but otherwise it's not too often. So that's why there's also not that much literature around available actually. Then we use ground cover. That's derived from remote sensing. We also, just got a new grant actually that will uh, enable us to develop a ground cover app just by the analysis of an RGB photo taken with a smartphone. We want to be able to estimate percent ground cover that then can be used as an input to drive the uh, irrigation scheduling app because we need to basically just be able to estimate green leaf area or percent ground cover to estimate evapotranspiration and then we need daily weather data and the output is like a one-week forecast as to whether the field need to be, needs to be irrigated or not. Well, there's a bunch of biophysical parameters. We measure ground cover, leaf area index, also soil moisture, and many other parameters, sometimes with three different methods. So that allows us to compare methods, which is the best one. So this is soil profile. It's quite uniform, usually silty clay loam. 
Uh, so it's quite heavy soils with a high water holding capacity. This is where shows like where we collected the data, so sort of quite intensive. We have like three uh, TDR access tubes installed for each plot. And then at the yellow square show the canopy sampling points. We had multiples of those in order to reduce the effects of like uh, taking measurements at the same time, like all over it because then you would just destroy the canopy. So these are the canopy sampling points. And this is actually M38 that we also use to characterize spatial variability of the experiments. Um, this one I skipped. This is the video of the octocopter that we used to fly. Um, these are the cameras we had, like an RGB, a multispectral camera, and then also a thermal camera that allows us to uh, measure canopy temperature. That actually gives us quite interesting information, as you can see in a wheat. So like, yeah, you go to, exp to the field and say, oh, it looks really nice. And then if you look at the maps, you see like there is a lot of spatial variability. And if you just do like surface water irrigation, it's really hard to actually get an equal distribution of the water. Like all these black, uh, these dark blue edges, you see that's basically places where you over apply. This is, but uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. That's why then we moved for the other experiments, like the maze on the left side that was then planted on beds, versus where, uh, whereas the wheat was planted on just flat beds where we got much more variability. So this is like flood irrigation, which is very difficult to uh, control the distribution of the water. I mean, there's a lot of work done before already, uh, was like uh, on land leveling and so on. But the easiest and the best solution is planting on beds. Uh, initially, we were told, oh, the beds, they will disappear here because you have such high clay content. But they remain throughout the season. So bed planting is the way to go in that area. I uh, just show you examples like on maize. Uh, you see the three plots like the dry, dry, and dry treatment, how that evolved over time. It's like mid March, and then like by the end of March, you see like big uh, differences between the two central dry treatment plots. And then we first thought, like, well, what happened here? Maybe they confused the treatment. Actually, the upper left treatment was actually supposed to be wet. The center and top was to be the dry treatment. I thought, oh, maybe the uh, the technician confused the treatments, but that we then looked at the uh, soil water dynamics and that was not the case. Uh, this is where we measured the data points. And actually, the red lines show you the field boundaries uh, before. So you basically really just uh, this differentiation follows the old field boundaries. And the reason was that uh, when we cultivated, prepared the land, they did it sort of just one pass. And they didn't break the pan layer or the plow layer from the rice cultivation. And this sort of shows you the soil water dynamics. The green ones are the, the lines for the top center plot where the crop grew really well. And whereas the red lines show you the soil water extraction actually from the drought stressed plots. And this, you see this like the soil moisture content was much higher in the drought stressed pro, uh, plots but the roots couldn't access it. And that's what it looked like. This is the, the center plot, heavily drought stressed, and that's the other one. Just north of it uh, is the other plot that received actually the same amount of water, but roots were actually able to access the water table. And so as you can see, uh, as I said before, you have a considerable upflow uh, from the water table, which we need to take into account. And, but it also allows us actually or tells us that we don't need to irrigate that much. Uh, with one to two or irrigates, uh, you have a start of irrigation. And with one to two additional irrigations, you can grow three tons of wheat and about eight tons of maize. So it's really big potential. And the investment isn't required isn't that large. So there is um, yeah, this good chances to increase production. And this was just basically some samples like of how this Use of UAVs also help you get better insights actually into analyzing your uh, experiments you run on farmers' fields because very often one gets results and doesn't quite know why. But if you measure all the different parameters, you can sort of make much more sense out of the data. Thank you.
Okay. Yeah, I skipped that actually. The business model was sort of, the development of a business model was at the heart of this project. I guess it's both like that. Um, so the idea is that we enable the irrigation service provider, this is at, and that so that he knows on which day he has to go irrigate the field. But that's probably not good enough because farmers are working with the place in our lives. And we need to integrate this into a, like in a, a larger project, basically, where we have integrated services where farmers can access the input ready. And we can also link them to the market. We have had actually a couple of visitors from India, so they are interested in getting additional sources for our maize because the service border is. Agriculture production is increasing very rapidly in those poultry farms and in more feed, so there is big demand. Um, so, but that will be not a project that will be right to give them a way of covering and uh, providing the basic service. Because farmers, they still didn't make for the second four days. They work basically part time in Dhaka, and they part time farmers, part time in some other birds to make enough in the summer. But they, they don't need Your service provider is one person who is doing uh, the tractor and that's your full farm. Yeah. Servicing other farmers. Yeah. All we need to Good. Thank you. Okay. It doesn't matter. There is nothing to change. So I will just do it from here. Anyway. My name is Stein Fritz. I'm from the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, IASA. It's based just south of Vienna. Some people have visited us already, like Bruno. It's in a nice castle, so you're all welcome to come. It has a very interesting history. It was founded in 72 during the Cold War and was the only institute which existed during, during the Cold War time to work together um, and it's symbolic for science diplomacy. Now, actually, interestingly, maybe Israel and Iran are going to join. Um, um, yeah. So um, I don't have really the time to tell you all about YASA because it's doing a lot of things, looking into the future around um, energy and climate change, poverty and equity, and um, food and water. Food and water is our field, specifically land use, land use change. The, the program uh, director is called Michael Obersteiner. He might be well known to you. He's leading this big program. It's the biggest program at YASA with around 60 people, actually. And I'm heading one group called Earth Observation Systems with, with around 15 people. Um, just to come back to food and water, a lot of the work we do is looking at future changes, for example, what happens if this family uh, here in, in Chad, which is a food for a week, uh, becomes more similar to that German family with all that consumption and all that change in terms of um, meat consumption, which has also a big impact. So it's not just that global population is by 2050, 9 billion, it's going to have a lot of impact on diet changes, which we're going to expect. And our models actually interesting tell us that if we all move towards a less um, meat diet, there, there could be some real, real benefit. That's what's coming out. I want to focus a lot on data here because that's my speciality. And I will tell a little bit more then later on how this data is used. But the overall objective of our data earth observation group is to provide better data for the modeling community. because garbage in, garbage out, and the worse it gets when you project these kind of land use maps into the future. The initial motivation why we built a lot of these crowdsourcing tools as well uh, was because we discovered that when you compared by that time the best global land cover maps, there was massive disagreement, and the disagreement was particularly in the cropland domain. Bruno actually um, uh, attended a workshop in 2011 where we said we need to do something around that and there was a lot of follow-up where we then stitched together maps from national countries where we knew they were much better than these global maps and we came up with a new refined 
uh, a global integrated hybrid map. But just to come back to GeoWiki, that's a visualization tool for lots of data around land cover and land use. Um, and just to show you one application and one of the crowdsourcing campaigns we've been doing on a global level, we work but also on, on national levels, um, there was the biofuel lobby which said, and that was a study in 2011 which came out, that there is this massive land reserve where we can have uh, biofuel crops grown on this marginal land which doesn't com compete with food production. Um, and we checked the map. We asked, can we have the map? Can we check it? We found out that this map, uh, which they used in this study from 2011, was based on very old coarse resolution uh, uh, remotely sensed based data where they sometimes used a mixed class and said there was additional land available. But when you actually looked at that, you could see it on Google Earth that this land clearly is not available. It's current use. It's probably used for food food production. Um, and we did a, a crowdsourcing campaign. We collected over 100,000 points globally. And we managed via this crowdsourcing campaign with relatively high confidence to downgrade these initial estimates. We didn't want to come up with completely new estimates, and we acknowledge there is still high uncertainty. But uh, we, we managed to uh, make people less enthusiastic around this marginal land reserve globally available. And that's a big debate. We're actually working now in Madagascar, doing something nationally, also really looking at what is the, the, the agricultural land available there. Uh, also with a massively growing population with a lot of degraded land which you have in, in, in Madagascar. So around the GeoWiki, we developed uh, certain tools and, and applications uh, with these points. We collected globally. We ran actually six campaigns over time. And we then also moved into serious gaming. We built these hybrid land cover maps where we, we, we had a lot of validation and training data to say which map performs best at which locations. We produced these fusion maps, um, hybrid maps. Um, and we also uh, then visualize this data and get feedback from people. Once they see the maps, uh, they can comment on the maps. They can draw polygons, and they can say, this map is correct at this location, uh, but you need to improve at another one. Just an example, what we've been also doing is, is gamification of that, making very simple tools and cross-platform applications that general people can actually get involved in research. We're also feeding them this information we collect back to, to people who are just working on that, because that's really important. Because people who contribute, they really want to engage. They want to see how their results are used and for what. We're just doing some work on field-sized crowdsource, field-sized delineation together with the University of uh, Princeton University. Um, and this is just a new thing we just launched three weeks ago. We already have classified more than 100,000 of those images. Um, and we used some of the images actually from the STARS project. And I want to touch more base with you and show you some results. I can show it on, on my phone, actually, where we also ask people to detect if they can see deforestation, forest loss over time, where you, we use those time series which came out, out of this web service which Digital Globe provided us with. That was actually really nice, and we're trying to explore more possibilities of making full use of that, that uh, um, quite rich web service. These are just images, but there's a lot of information you can actually potentially crowdsource on, on them. <clears throat> this is the crowdsourcing tools of the GeoWiki, what we call family. We have different branches. We are also working together with Wageningen University, specifically on livestock, <clears throat> improving global distribution of livestock maps with different modules. One module is, for example, a man manure management module, where we're trying to better understand how manure is managed, if it's, if it's managed at all, if it's applied to the field, where it's applied, how it's applied, if it goes to a digester, yes or no, and all these issues around manure management versus solid and, and um, liquid. Then we're also building a lot of um, tools where, which allow everybody, actually, this is all free and open, to collect data on the ground, uh, attach geotech pictures. You can define your own legend for that as well. It's just one example. Interestingly, this was taken up 
by the Brazilians, and they are now trying to do something with one, 500 farmers, um, quite operational. Um, and the motivation for them was to say that we need a kind of monitoring system on the ground, which is quite simple, because during the growing season, they didn't properly manage, due to cloud cover problems, um, their kind of crops using remote sensing. And the way we are now building this is in a two-way communication platform that they, are also, they also can issue warnings to the farmer. So when there is a disease, when one farmer detects a disease on their crop, documents it with the geotech pictures, it can be taken up and other farmers can of course look at it, but when somebody then at the ministry uh, or at the agency which works for the ministry decides uh, that it's worth to issue a warning, they can warn the farmers in the other municip municipios around. We're trying this in the north, north of Brazil. Another thing we're doing, I'm trying to move here quite quickly, I I'm aware of your time restrictions, is to try to link wealth indices um, uh, with remote sensing data. So to use this kind of um, asset uh, uh, questionnaires, which, which we do um, with, with so-called high-frequency data collection, where we also use um, tablets now in Ethiopia, uh, uh, create a wealth index, and then uh, use very high-resolution remote sensing, do some um, land cover classification, and try to relate these wealth in indices with, with land cover uh, related properties which we can extract. A lot of other work we do in this ecosystem services and management is around biophysical modeling where we use a, a so-called EPIC model. We also participate quite actively in the ACMIP project and we do quite some work, a lot specifically in Europe on um, trying to do modeling what, for example, is the advantage of reduced tillage and so on. And we have a, also a forest model. So we really look at the whole land base around forest, livestock, and, and crop cropland. Um, and this is our kind of workhorse that is the, the biggest group, which is run by Peter Havlik, around economic modeling. And we are actually also engaged in Ethiopia, looking at smallholders now, trying to look at what it would be a certain policy in a country on, on smallholder farmer using exactly that um, economic land use model. Um, that has been used for a lot of different application policy scenarios, specifically with respect to GHG emission, um, but also it, it, it can be used um, uh, with respect to uh, certain policies around uh, um, smallholder farmers, and we're trying to demonstrate that in Ethiopia. The ideal scenario which we are Envisaging what which you haven't yet realized is that you can have this high frequency data collection on the ground with tablets every month and then kind of monitor near real time the impact of your policy. But that's still a dream that's, that's not yet realized, but that could be some futuristic scenario and I stop here. Thank you. Everybody is very hungry, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Please, please. Do you have any questions? Yes, Bram. Yeah, that, that's a very challenging question indeed. But maybe the answer is the, the usual one, you know, it depends really how, how the information is used. I mean, just to refer to, uh, I might use this opportunity to talk a bit also about this Sigma project. So um, we are also involved in this quite big European funded project, Sigma. And there the idea is also to make uh, um, monitoring more transparent and to 
uh, get more global knowledge about where droughts are and if there are simultaneous droughts globally. But it's the same discussion. If you have speculators, uh, the, 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 the relationship then that to reduce price volatility by transparency is by far not entirely clear. That, that is assumed and there is definitely a value, but it could also be that all speculators use that information and then kind of it doesn't help society overall. And, and me, information can always be misused and in particular once you have these more uh, uh, privacy issues when you go down to the, to the farm level. That's, that's I think a big, a big uh, uh, unknown, you know, what, what is th the benefit. But I think we have to take the risk that's, that's my personal position, to really go ahead and try to make as much data open as possible and hope that people are using it for the good rather for the bad. And, and I'm convinced that the overall benefit we get by, by you ha know, having this data and doing the analytics on them is higher than, than the actual downside, downside of it. I'm, I'm convinced of that, but of course there are other voices and especially you know, once an individual gets affected and the court case has been made then, then it becomes a big problem, and then also people become very paranoid. And that has already happening uh, due to the history I had about NSA and so on. But I th yeah. No, no, it did not. It's still not available to us. I don't know if FAO has it by now um, allowed to share. I know they had some negotiation, but we did actually a crowdsourcing exercise to remap the, the cropland in Ethiopia. We did it specifically it was for a, a US aid hackathon, and we, we, we did it ourselves with crowdsourcing because we found that this still was better than, than the global maps. And
I have to say that, that the, I would wish that some of the data which is, is it at FAO would flow actually a little bit better, I have to say. <laughs> no, but, but I think it's a very good point. I, I want to make one more point that I found really interesting. Um, I was a, a, a recently at a meeting um, and there was a keynote by this guy from the Open Knowledge Foundation. Um, and he said open data is only open when first it has to fulfill three criteria. So the first one is that no, it's accessible. Secondly, there is an infrastructure there that ordinary people can interact with it. And that many times it does not happen. Data is made available in a format which nobody can use. And there is still a lot of work to be done that you can really interact and, and understand the data as a, a normal person or potentially even a non-scientist. And if you are there, you can describe your data, put it open, that a non-scientist can understand it, then it's fully open. And then the third thing they said was, you know, we need open minds as well. And that, that's another thing which we still don't have everywhere. So. That's a good conclusion. <laughs> Thanks a lot to all the speakers. I'm going to give you a